We are live. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. So we've got a bunch of people with questions. Um, but hopefully everyone knows me. I'm Sarah. Um, Kath. And I'm Kath. <laughs> And we are uh, two of the three members of our little team here. And we are doing basically a series of Ask Me Anything about lots of topics. Um, today, we are diving into the idea of this new Squarespace platform, which is 7.1. This is a little confusing for a lot of people, I think. Don't you agree, Kath? I do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because the... The most, the previous iteration of Squarespace, which is what most folks are on, was called 7.0. And that was a big change from the previous iteration. It was an all new platform. Mm -hmm. 7.1 is also an all new platform, but they went with a wacky naming convention <laughs> and called it 7.1, which would indicate that it's just like a software update. The reality right. is it's an all new platform. It's not... Um, it's not connected. There's not a button you push and you upgrade the system to 7.1. So just to be really clear, if you see um, the features of 7.1 and you want to, um, you you're very, you find that very appealing, know that it's not just pushing a button. It's literally starting your website over, which includes, say, your commerce records. It includes your blog comments, any data, any historical data that you have in Squarespace's analytics system, that is all starting afresh. Right. Um, so it is a brand new system, despite the funky naming um, convention. Um, there's, like I said, there's not a direct migration path. Some things that I think people need to know about the new platform is, is that it, um, previously there was a whole suite of templates that you could choose from. Um, now it looks like there's a suite of templates to choose from. The reality is that there's actually only one template and the templates that they show you are different, are just different styles. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a design. So um, you're really choosing a design, not a template. Yeah. Yeah. They're not, it's just one template with multiple sort of example designs um, would be the right. best, best way of thinking about it. Um, if you are on the more current version of 7.0, see, this gets very complicated when you talk about it. Um, and the, um, if you're on the most current version of 7.0, which would be the Brine family of templates, um, you are probably, and also this was on, I think Fulton and a few others, you right. could create what are called indexes. And within that, you would nest individual pages. Um, that in 7.1, I think this is actually probably one of the better improvements. Some people disagree with me. But um, what it is now is it is a um, single page with sections just like you would expect as opposed to that you can do different colors and different styles. Um, yeah but not um, this sort of funky multi-page thing. I believe there will likely be um, some uh, fewer people making big SEO mistakes um, because of this, but that's yet to be, I, I don't have enough data to, to prove that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, that's, that's something that'll be interesting to watch. Um, the... There's a new feature that I actually, I like, Kath, I don't know how you feel about it. Um, mm -hmm. They're called portfolios. I have mixed feelings. It depends on how you use your portfolio. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it depends on how you use them. If you use them as they're intended, um, I think it's actually a pretty cool feature. Yeah. Um, but it's, um, it's not... Uh, it's it's not a database like you can't use it yeah, it's not a tag and category. yeah and we've asked squarespace if they have categorization and organization coming for the portfolio collections basically they say eventually but it's not a priority so that's definitely something that for some people could be a bit of a frustration for kath and i who really like to get granular with our organization of client websites um that is something that's a little frustrating because we still are kind of like oh maybe just using the blog so we can do more organization is a better solution um but i i do we've I used it for a couple of clients yeah one client it, used it as an online catalog and it was fantastic like it was 
so great. Yeah, yeah. So one client was an artist, and and he used it as a um, basically creating like a um, sort of the feel of like a gallery book that you could swipe through. Yeah. Um, and then another one used it to sort of he's an event photographer, and so each in his portfolio, each portfolio collect each portfolio item in the collection was for a different event. Again, it made yeah. sense because it wasn't needing to have that granular organization. Um, right. But if you were say you know had a more a really complex portfolio, you could be a little frustrated by that limitation. Yeah, yeah. Um, like if you want people to, um, let's say you're a surface pattern designer <laughs> and you want people to choose by color or type of pattern or something, then that can't be done with a portfolio. You would need to use the blog to sort of set yeah. that one up. Um, and so, oh, okay. So while you're um, talking, uh, one of the one of the uh, participants has asked if we can share the site. So I'll I go just find them. Up, I just pulled up. Oh, I just pulled them. up Johnny's. If you can um, okay. And um, so that's yeah. And so that's a big that. So I actually think it's a cool feature. I like it. Um, I also like that you can really customize the layout of those, and you still have a nice internal yeah. navigation. Um, I think for artists, they'll be really thrilled. Um, yeah, that's and I and I also think that it creates um, enough uh, that feature. Also, I I feel that it encourages people to write more content. Yes, about their portfolio pieces, which is something yeah. that we've really struggled with convincing people to do. Mm -hmm. um, and we know over and over again when people do do that, when they provide more context, their sites are more successful. Yeah. So I think just that. The, that little agenda I have makes that. <laughs> One of the things based on what we were talking about with the portfolio <laughs> is that, um, it, especially if you've been working on Squarespace a lot for clients, but, or even if you're new, but you've, uh, or not new, but you've had a site for a long time on Squarespace is you really need to get your head around how different it is and be okay with yeah. learning that. I think that was my issue with portfolios. I was so, stuck on doing it this certain way and loving that it could be categorized in tags right. and not seeing the potential of the new feature. So now I'm more balanced, I think. One of the, it's because I have, do, I frankly, I have been probably myself and a, another designer have been sort of one of the couple of the biggest critics at 7.1. So I have dogged on it a lot in terms of it not being, I feel that they could have put they should have delayed releasing it to be quite honest. Um, but one of the things I really like about it is that we use blogs a lot for different things. Um, and mm -hmm. Kath actually has a blog post that we can drop in the link <laughs> about all the different ways you can use, you can use a, you can use a blog. And one of the limitations that we consistently ran up against in 7.0 for clients was that um, once you choose your blog layout, every blog, every other blog. So that's not blog post. That means the collection of all the content in your blog. Every other blog was stuck in that layout. And what we were um, really excited to discover is that in 7.1, you actually can select your layout. So if you want just sort of a traditional blog post stacked, if you want to have a grid, if you want to have, there's all kinds of things you can do and you can change yeah. that depending on what's appropriate for the actual collection of pieces. So if you have your case studies, maybe you want to have that be like kind of a nice tidy grid, but your actual blog with, with the articles and advice mm -hmm. tips, you may want it to look more like a journal and you can do that, which is something we've want. We have done so many crazy town hacks yeah. to create that. And it's so so for us, it's like, oh, harps and angels. <laughs> yeah, you can find the deal with 7.1, so that's great. Yeah, yeah, that's so we have a nine inch thing. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry for the lag. I don't know if it's, I've had issues with our plumbing in this house. I swear it's connected. It's causing the internet to go slower. I don't know why. <laughs> it's just one of those days. Um, we have a series of questions already. We have almost, we have nine questions. Wow. Do you want to answer them or do you have a few more I points you'd like to answer? On one other point. The other big difference, and this is the thing that personally as a professional that I have struggled with is the actual workflow for selecting typefaces, colors, spacing, yeah. all of that is completely different. I actually, I, I will die in the hill that it sucks. Um, it could just be so much 
better in terms of the way it's thought out. I do think if you are a DIYer, so if you're someone who likes to DIY your site um, and you don't have, say, a designer's workflow, because I think we do work on websites quite differently than the average civilian, yeah. <laughs> um, it will probably not bother you like it bothers me. It's just my workflow has radically slowed down. Um, and that's, and it's not even just a learning, it's a, um, it's literally that there's like four clicks when I'm used to having one. Um, yeah, the quick issue is, uh, yeah. And that adds up, frankly, if you're doing an entire site and you may not notice if you just do one site every three years for your own business, but if you're doing, you know, a site every week, you notice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, oh, look at all these great questions. I know. So I don't know if you um, want me to read them out loud for people or. I want to go see everyone. I actually, um, there's one I have questions about at the very end, um, which okay. is Joe. Hi, Joe. I, I know, I, I know Joe. <laughs> um, <laughs> is, um, she had asked about the, makes sense to use a portfolio page for a product overview page. And um, if you could kind of elaborate a little bit more with that question, um, it would it be for a store? <laughs> that would be um, just a, li a little more context so we can answer that question. Cause I think I know what you're asking, but I wanna make sure. All right, I'll get started with the top one. So uh, from Liz, my biggest hesitation about switching or even starting with 7.1 is the feeling that there's a lack of control around design. It all looks and feels more DIY for non-designers. Am I totally being resistant or is that DIY quality to 7.1? I think you kind of answered that question already. <laughs> I, I think, it, I mean, I feel like we've created some really slick looking websites on 7.1. Yeah. Um, they definitely don't. I'm going to drop the art hive link in too, because I think that's a good one. Um, what I will say, so I know Liz and Liz is a designer. Um, I, um, I believe that it was designed with the ethos that a DIYer, so a business owner or someone with a side hustle or an artist um, could go to the template store, which is what they call it. And grab a template, remember they're all the same, but they look different, pop their stuff in and hit launch. I really believe that was the ethos. And I do think that, that that is where that kind of almost DIY feel is coming from. To do really deep customizations, I am finding is a lot more work. Would you say that? That's yeah, if we need to know a cap. lot more code. There's a few things that you no longer need to code, which is great, like backgrounds and stuff. But uh, yeah, mm -hmm. for a lot of things that didn't need code before, we need it. Um, finding the selectors is a bit different now. There's a lot yeah, that's the different. the code itself is much more bulky. Would that be a good way of putting it, Kath? Um, <laughs> it's harder for me anyway. <laughs> I'm set up, there's actually, how many color palettes are there in, are there eight color palettes? I think so. And so each one of those color palettes has their own in the biz, what we call selectors, basically when you think of it as like code, a chunk of code. So there's just yeah. a lot more to sift through to make more granular modifications. So yeah. I think that Liz is onto something that there is a DIY, it is definitely built with the idea of people DIYing their websites rather than. Yeah, um, and being, and being um, happy with the overall look as it is, yeah. Yes. And whereas 7.1 was definitely a sort of meet in the middle, like a designer could take it and do relatively quickly, pretty impressive stuff or someone, um, you know, a DIYer could take the template and make it look a certain way. Yeah. That's more difficult. Um, there is the like, that's a good question. But yeah, and workflow, like you mentioned earlier, it really, if you're a designer and you're doing websites once or twice a week or once or twice a month, even, um, the workflow is very different. And so and you gotta get I, I wish we'd sort of done, but we, Catherine, that's not really our style. We just kind of figure it out as we go along mm -hmm. um, is probably we should have stepped back and thought through what our new workflow is. Yeah. And we, we just we're getting there. <laughs> adapt the workflow that we'd spent many years developing yeah. to this new system. And I did was not as clear eyed as I could have been about the, 
reality that is a brand new, it's it's almost like using Webflow instead of Squarespace. Like they, they're not the same type of platform, but it it's like kind of similar, but a lot of things are totally different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like completely learning a new platform. So, you know, yeah. definitely dive in and learn it, but keep, just pretend you're learning a new platform. That's one way to kind of get around that. Yeah, and that's what I, I got a lot, because I did have a almost tearful call to Kath one, one morning because I couldn't get things to work the way I was used to. And I think I should have gone into that with a different perspective than I, that I really was working with a brand new system. So. And it changed our workflow a bit. We've started screen sharing as we work together on. Yeah, it has workflow. actually changed our workflow <laughs> substantially. Yeah. Um, now that we've figured out that we needed to change our workflow. Yeah. That's kind of this. <laughs> Another question from Liz is, uh, can you both talk about your own personal experiences with switching a site to 7.1 and also building a new site in 7.1 and the things that you love and the things that are not working? So I think we've talked a lot about that. I have not personally switched someone from 7.0 to 7.1 because I want to wait for a migration path. I think it's a little bit, yep. it has been done and I, you know, talked to some designers who've done it. And there's a process, my advice to anyone who reaches out to me, because I do get leads asking me about this, um, is have Squarespace on chat with you while you do it. Like, you know, you, you'll you have to rebuild your site and then have them on chat when you're getting that refund, when you're um, switching your domain to the next one. Like, make sure that you've got them on speed dial, basically. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree completely. Um... I, I, you know, I, my personal web, my business website is no longer on Squarespace at all um, for complicated reasons. And, um, but it is still the primary platform that we use. And um, so I have not moved my own website, obviously, because I'm no longer on any version of Squarespace. Um, I have done some experiments with regard to migrating blog content in particular, because that tends to be the most valuable um, content asset that people have. It should be if it's not work on that. Um, and I, <laughs> sorry, not sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I mean, honestly, people tell me they want to be found online, but they don't want to create content online. And I don't know, have an answer. If that's the, the corner that you, you're painted into. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't, um, I, so I have done some experiments. The mic, there is not a, a, an official migration path. So unless there is a very good reason, and there are some, like we're going to be working with someone who's moving from 7.0 to 7.1 in yeah. September. Um, she's on an extremely old Squarespace template. It's from like 2012. Um, wow. So it's got some issues. It's limiting what she can do with her site. Um, she also has a completely new plan for her content. So migration is less of an issue. Um, and that's someone who I would say, well, okay, I'm okay with doing, you have a 7.0 site and I'm okay with moving you to 7.1 because your circumstances are such that it's basically like a new site. Um, yeah. not, it's not a, a migration itself. And until Squarespace has a migration path, which they did when they went from 5.0 to 6.0, which became 7.0. This is very weird nomenclature. <laughs> um, they did eventually develop a migration path. And so that's something just to be aware of is that I would be extremely shocked if they never rolled that out because it would just be, it would leave so many customers the lurch eventually it just seems like a dumb business move yeah all right so the next one uh, is i'm on 7.0 right now the site is half done should i switch trish are you on or trisha I, are you on right now i, I don't I'm not sure see if she is um you know it really depends on on right now, <laughs> everyone will get emailed everyone will get emailed a replay so um, yeah, Kath, my, my gut instinct is that she should, if her site is half done, she should just stick with her half done site and finish it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. you know, I have not, Squarespace has in the past has a pretty good, um, track record of keeping their older versions of their platform relatively up to date. A lot of people are still onboarding onto 7.0. There is a back door to get onto 7.0. Um, so I would say that unless, 
unless your business is primarily a store, um, in which case I would give 7.0 a more serious thought because there are some good changes coming to stores, but they're only going to be rolled out to 7.1. And that's the most I can say. And I'm really sorry. Um, I would say just stick with the 7.0 site and finish it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, you're <laughs> yeah. All right. Next question. Okay. And SEO was 7.1. I read Nico's post last week about 7.1. And Sarah, I saw you in cast comments uh, about, um, post and SEO and portfolio. So bottom line is all this stuff in 7.0 more of a hindrance than a help. <laughs> so I actually really like, so I'm going to drop the, um, the, the link to Miko's, um, so organized, uh, blog post about, uh, uh about 7.1. And I agree with much of it. I don't agree with it wholeheartedly. Miko is a great designer. She's been around as long as I have. Um, and she really knows her stuff. And she, like me, is one of the old Squarespace specialists that don't exist anymore. Um, <laughs> and so I um, so I liked a lot of what she had to say. I th say. I think it was very clear, clear eyed. I think it was very harsh. Um, and she really dials in some of the core issues of, um, of 7.1. Um, one thing I disagreed with her was she felt that 7.1 would be, um, uh, would be bad for SEO. And I actually disagree with her here. And here's why, um, I see so many user errors in terms of SEO on Squarespace 7.0 for a bunch of reasons. And they're very, the reasons that I totally understand if people don't, if they're a designer who doesn't do search or if they're a DIYer, um, I totally get how you can make these mistakes. So the first being that I'll see people go in and they'll optimize every page in an index that actually is often construed as keyword stuffing by Google. But what I have a bigger problem is, is when you do that, you will often have a random section in an index in 7.1 pop up in your Google search results. I had this same problem when I was on Squarespace. Um, and what it does is it shows you the section of your page without the context of the rest of the pages. Yeah, and I've had that with my index pages. It's, it's a huge problem. So yeah. I find it so problematic actually to the point that on many 7.0 sites, I end up recommending that people no index, which it means Tell Google don't to ind don't scan this individually. The individual pages in index sections. That, that's how bad it is in 7.0, um, and it still is scanned as a whole page. All of it is the index. But what we end up with is duplicate content issues. We end up with multiple headings issues. We end up with weird keyword stuff. The contextless search results. We end up with a lot of problems. And so it's it's really really frustrating. Um, I also in 7.1 they introduced um, a heading four, which we've been asking for for at least ten years. Yeah, and paragraph three, which is great for like smaller. Yeah, and yeah, and multiple paragraph types. So what I, the, my argument is that the DIY mistakes that we see or the designers who aren't, who don't know about SEO, um, they will be less likely to make those mistakes because the system isn't built in to create conditions that necessitate those mistakes. Um, one of the most common mistakes I see on 7.0 sites is actually headings in the footer. So what we'll see is a whole bunch of um, headings because people want to use certain font styles in the footer. What that actually does is you're actually cannibalizing the on-page SEO you've done. And which doesn't matter what all that means, really. But basically, you've, you've done a bunch of great work creating an awesome, say, an awesome blog post. And then your footer is has a heading one that says, you know, about us. What you're doing is you're saying like, hey, Google, guess what? That post title may not be as important as you think it is because about us might be important. And right. so you can see what happens is Google's like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, I mean, I, I don't have a better way of explaining it. It just creates a lot of confusion. And so because of some of these things that they've done in terms of being able to more granularly, basically we have eight, eight type faces we can use, right? 
Or is it seven? Seven. Wait, I think it's seven. Yeah. Seven. seven. Eight, yeah. Yeah. It's four. It's eight, one, two, three, four, four, and then three pairs. Yeah. yeah. And so what I'm yeah. hoping I'll see from DIYers and you know from designers who that's not their thing is that we see them use the paragraphs to make design-based font decisions instead of the headings that they'll stick with using the headings for actually important con like contextual um bits of information yeah. yeah that's what i'm hoping so in theory i can see 7.1 sites performing better than 7.0 sites when they're done by DIYers who don't know a lot about search. Right. Does that make sense? Because that's like a whole lot of like. <laughs> yes, yeah, okay. All right. So next question, can I create unique email notifications to customers? Currently on 7.0 is the only option is order notification. I would like to be able to send update if needed and the only way is direct mail from my main server. I'm imagining this is co a commerce question, right? Yes, and I know Lynn. Lynn okay. is a really um is a really cool glass artist. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. I'm like like his stuff is really cool. Um <laughs> and um so and he has a store with a pretty complex store, probably the most complex anyone should be doing on there. Um, I'm gonna drop Lynn's URL in here. Just okay. of cool stuff. Um, and he has a lot of odd shaped stuff, different weights, really all kinds of stuff, um, custom orders. And the problem that he and other people who do custom work like he does um, run up against with a lot of e-commerce systems is that they don't have unique notifications per item. Um, there are some really good changes coming to commerce and Squarespace. Um, I do not believe that unique, um, unique item notification, like unique shipping type notifications or unique email notifications will be coming anytime soon. Um, and in fact, even in Shopify, which is why I tend to recommend these days, um, for people who need that kind of thing, you do need a third party app to make that happen. So, um, right. womp womp. So would um, this be a situation where Z Zapier or Zapier would help? And that's what I was going to say. I think this is a situation where okay. the, newer, the newer Zapier integration, and I'll drop that link, um, would could potentially um, solve some of that problem because you could connect it to your email marketing tool. Uh, and create some unique communication that way. Um, and so that would be probably what I would explore. Um, I'm not guaranteeing that that would solve the problem, but that would be where I would start. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, yeah, I mean the other solution could potentially oh, the, the be actually for Zapier, right? So yeah. is it just Zapier.com? Um it's there's a um Zapier a Squarespace guide. That's what I was looking for as I was talking. Um oh, okay. but the other option is in Squarespace Commerce, you can now add API keys. And I I oh, right. okay. yeah. And um that was um in that sense, you can actually use an alternative email marketing tool, the API. A API is basically a way to make apps talk to each other. Mm -hmm. um, you could potentially, and again, I have not tested this. So this is me being, um, I believe this would likely do what you're wanting it to do. You could theoretically use like say ConvertKit, their API and make, um, Squarespace Commerce and um, the email marketing tool talk to each other and right. do some more sophisticated things. Because there are workarounds. Um, they're just complex, I think, would be the... Um, they start the, making your, your choo-choo train graph. That's what yeah, exactly. <laughs> I would like... So start here. Start at the, the thing that you want 
I so would step back that <laughs> and draw out literally on paper because that's what I start with these kinds of things. Yeah. When X happens, I want Y to happen. And then start looking at the solutions that could potentially make that work. All so right. it's it's an it's it's a real pain. <laughs> <laughs> Next question is any advice on loading video content onto 7.1, ideally, ideally in a free non third party option? No, no. Squarespace does not allow you to do that. Um, I mean, frankly, you don't want your video loading straight from your, um, straight from your website because it'll make it unbelievably slow. Um, so, um, I personally mostly use Vimeo for this. Um, and I but, use YouTube for mine, mm -hmm. but if you really don't yeah. want to use, like use Loomworks and you can embed it. You can yeah. grab the embed code from use Loom, which I think is free up to a certain number of videos. And then you can embed it using, yeah. um, you can even embed it using the video block I've learned. <laughs> um, yeah, you have, you can. Yeah. Um, so you don't need a code block for that necessarily. So you can embed it from use Loom. So that means you don't need to, you could just quickly do your video if you're not recording it with a camera, but you're just doing screen share, for example. Um, but yeah, I mean, really, there's just not a, I dropped the link in there. Um, Is it Loom or use Loom? Did they change it? Uh, awesome. They changed, their, they changed their URL. Yeah. Um, Cool. But yeah, I really, you're going to end up, you know, having to go with a YouTube, Vimeo, Wistia. It's, there's just not a, I mean, even frankly, I actually worked with a film trailer company recently and they were not on Squarespace. They were on WordPress and they really wanted to load things natively from their website for security reasons. And it literally would have, there was, it would have not, the site would not have functioned if they had done that. I mean, and I'm being really honest. So video is just the reality is it needs to be hosted by um, some kind of external yeah. service. And Squarespace doesn't really give you a choice anyway. So, all right. There used to be. Yeah, I know. They don't get, I mean, yeah. If there was a choice, I'd be. In a header, does that still exist? Rotating images. Yeah, like the slideshow. Yeah, they have it. And we do that. One. Yeah, I think if you start with gallery, like a gallery page. It's a gallery section. Yeah. Yeah. Or a section. Yeah, it's a gallery section. There's, gosh, about Cath, how many different, there's a ton of different gallery styles mm -hmm. um, in 7.1. And um, one of the things that, this is actually a nice upgrade, I think, is that they do allow you to, um, so in 7.0, you in the, the older system, you basically once you picked a gallery style. Yeah, that was it across the board. You had that, you had to use that everywhere. And with the new version, um, you can use on say one page, you can use a slideshow and on another page, you can use a grid and you don't have to choose that every gallery is going to, you know, is stuck being a grid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that's yeah, actually so. great. Like we have had to use a lot of code for other things, but for those kinds of things, we no I longer have to, have to code, code that in the most ridiculous yeah. way. So yeah. Yeah. I was kind of like, what? <laughs> <laughs> One thing right. though is you can no longer commingle videos in your gallery. Yeah, yeah. Which I had a lot of sadness over because that's something that I actually have to do every once in a while. Yeah, we've had clients that wanted videos, like had a video a portfolio versus a, um, you know, visual one. And it's hard to do that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the so, second question under that is exactly the same. So we can, you can answer both. <laughs> and then, um, yeah. Does it make sense to use a portfolio page for your product overview page? And then she continues by saying, I am currently building a site for someone who is selling PPE, but not selling directly from the site. So I need a product overview page and then a product detail for each product. Yes, that would store. be a great option. That would be a great use case for portfolios. Yes. 
Yeah. That like that is the thing I like about this is that you could and the cool thing is that you could also have um uh you so if say her gowns for example had needed um you know had some images some descriptions a video and like a pdf but the masks just had like a picture and didn't really need anything else on like a description you could have them have very different sort of content in the individual item yeah. um and so that could be really, really, and you could even have an inquiry form on that landing. So it actually could be a really good way to think of it like a landing page almost for the product. Um, and then that you can gather them all together in this portfolio collection. Yeah. So they all kind of live together and you'd have a really nice overview page with everything in that um, collection. So that is a, that's a great use case, Joe, actually. I, th I really like that. Um, now I'm going to want to see it when it's done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a really, and then it would be very easy for the user because they're not going to have to go back. They can just click next and tab through the different, um, because when you're thinking about the user experience, that's yeah. where like, yes, maybe they need masks, but maybe they also need gowns, except gloves, et cetera. And so they're tabbing three. Yeah. So they're not I'm going to go all the way back. Yeah. Um, and the over and Joe had the comment. It said there was confusing because there's so many ways to create this overview page. Yes, I know. I had the same reaction um, <laughs> because you can you can do a lot. And I would keep it pretty simple is what I, I came down to. Um, up in the chat, there's a link to Johnny Wolf, his photography portfolio, um, and he did some. He has some nice um, layouts for that are pretty simple for his portfolio. So it's yeah, a good, we'll start with. Um, you had a question earlier, I think it was Joe was asking, what's the difference between a DIYer and a designer? And that was just up, that's in the chat. So I thought I'd quickly answer that. Basically a designer is a web designer who regularly is in Squarespace or any platform and designing sites for clients. And DIYers are business owners, hobbyists, people who are doing their own website, have never designed a website for themselves or maybe have done one or two for themselves or a friend, mm -hmm. but they're not a web designer by trade or profession. Yeah. So that's why I would like if if web design is one of it's a is a substantial part of your income, then you're a designer. If if you are maybe someone who, you know, maybe does a site for a friend, that's where we'd say you're, you know, every once in a while, then maybe you're a DIYer. But it's it's a fuzzy area. <laughs> I, I started out as a DIYer <laughs> and then ended up a DIYer. <laughs> All right, next question. Do you find clients having a harder time making some edits on their own? Any tips for them? Ooh. Well, we're all about training. So a live training session uh, and then um, sending, uh, really explaining to them that, that they need to use Squarespace's tools um, like to like to get in touch with customer support, know where to look for the answers, we do do video trainings, but because Squarespace so often changes the look of their dashboard and the features, I've found that I'll do a training and then literally the next day it's obsolete. So I'm always encouraging people to go and check Squarespace's latest information as well. Yeah. And basically um, what, I, what we've really been trying to emphasize to people is that if something seems different than when you did your training, Ask Squarespace first before freaking out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't be afraid. Customer support it's, is free. Use it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, because it's it's part of what you're paying for. Mm -hmm. um, but most of the time, like, honestly, a huge percentage of the time when someone tells us, oh, I spent four hours trying to figure this out and I just don't know what I'm doing wrong. And we'll go look and be like, oh, well, this they've I've done an update. And so it's not ever, it's very rarely actually the client, but I, we see that even more in um, 7.1 because there's one, like the, there's a lot of tutorials online um, mm -hmm. and people, they're not, they haven't been updated. I probably need to do that with some of my content. They haven't been updated to reflect. This is for 
7.0. It's actually hard to find the yeah. different tutorials in Squarespace's support system too. Um, they say it at the top, but I feel like it's pretty inobvious. Um, so I think a lot of the issues are actually less coming from clients not being able to make edits on their own and more actually just that the resources out there are really fuzzy and things because it is a new system is being changed quickly. Um, yeah. So for example, we, when we first started working with 7.1, the, the verbiage for the headings was um, they had very odd, it was driving me bananas, extra, large, heading, heading, extra large heading, large yeah. heading medium heading, <laughs> small heading. And I was going bananas. I was like, Kath, how, like, what is this? And it took me, I poked around the code and figured out that it was heading one, heading two, heading three, heading four. It was very confusing. And then, so we did a site on using that weird nomenclature. And then the like, next day or two, they changed it to actually a normal nomenclature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that, yeah, I, it, that, that uh, yeah, because even designers are having issues. So, um, so Sarah, there's a, okay, we'll answer this one in the poll. Then there's a question in the chat too. So I'm a total font freak. Is there really only one option for the font for all headers? Yes, you need code. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you literally, yes, that is, I, we, I, I write code for all of our headers now. Yeah. I mean, if they just want the font, one font for headers, then that's fine. Then you don't need code, but otherwise, yeah, you're going to need code if you want. Yeah. I'm crying. I, usually, I mean, I tend to be pretty observed <laughs> in my usage of font because I don't want to create a font sandwich. But um, I usually might, I have sort of header three, usually has a very specific look because I want it to be the different header. And yeah. I had sort of a Sarah thing. And um, I have to write the code for it. I mean, fortunately, it's not that hard. Um, you just, I have a little cheat sheet and I do copy paste and some futzing. Um, but it can be, it's, it's, a, it's stupid. <laughs> Actually, I mean, <laughs> yeah. if you haven't already, if you're a design, if you're, if you're watching this and you're a DIYer, you might not need to do this, but if you're a designer, you need to create your own library of code that you're going to probably be using over and over again. We have for our design and day process, we have a spreadsheet. And I just use control F to look for the specific thing I'm looking for. Um, Sarah, do you use the spreadsheet or do you have your own library? Do you, maybe it's a mix of the two. But um, it's a mix. I have, mix. I also have a very classy um, edit document on my desktop. Yeah, well, you know, just like <laughs> <laughs> Which is so, but definitely like, start a notes. library. <laughs> Whatever work. Yes, I sometimes use my notes. So I'm like, where, what website did we do this on again? So I'm trying to be a bit more organized about that. Whenever we do a website and we use code, and it's the first time we've ever used that code, I keep it and put it in the library for our process. So start doing that. Get used to doing that. Yeah, um, maybe even hire a developer regardless. who can. Regardless. Yeah. Um, I would, uh, yeah, I would say like even an hour with someone who's really good at code and say, I need all this code. I want to learn it. Yeah, I want to have it in my library and pay someone to sort of teach you so, the basics. We, um, you really recommend Heather Toby. Toby, Heather Toby? I mean, I shout out Heather because I think yeah. she's great. She's fantastic. She's not her brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she will do the work for you, but she also does training. I've, I've done a training session with her and it really helped, really helped just, you know, to do, and I'm thinking of, well, I'm not thinking, I'm going to book her again soon because 7.1 is so different. I want her to help me find things quickly. I'm just really slow with this new system. Yeah. And the reason I, I really specifically recommend Heather by name is because she is very good at hearing what your problem is. As opposed to if you say like, well, I want this thing to happen, she always steps back and says, okay, so what is the outcome you're trying to create? As yeah. opposed to just like shoving code to make that thing happen. So it, her approach is much more sustainable than a lot of the developers out there who do similar work. So that's why when people ask me um, who they would go to to learn coding or to get some help with coding a website, I say Heather because she often comes up with much better solutions because I've used her for some really sticky things 
And she has come up with some really great solutions that actually were much better than way, the way I was thinking because she came at it from a different angle. So Yeah. And sometimes it's a non-code solution. She'll say, well, you know, you could just do this. And it's like, oh, right. You know, so she's fantastic that way. Um, okay. So looking at the chat so we don't lose it, Jane uh, has asked a question. I was having trouble with the poster image block and the text going beyond the image on mobile view versus it automatically sizing to fit the image on mobile. Is there an easy workaround for that other than fiddling with the copy to make it fit both desktop and mobile? And then I think this next question here is similar. Uh, did you happen to notice that paragraph three actually gets bigger on the mobile phone? I haven't noticed that yet, but I do know that mobile- So the paragraph three being bigger on mobile, I would actually report to Squarespace as a bug. Yeah. I would really recommend anytime you see something like that, um, because while they'll probably give you the brush off, um, it, it would likely be something that I could see them fixing um, because I have noticed a few mobile things like that that are um, a little funky and I believe them to be actually bugs that need to be addressed. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, get into, especially with mobile stuff um, because it, there's no styling in it anymore. Um, that it's automatic. Sometimes it just isn't working. And so, yeah, let Squarespace know. I've been using awesome. little bits of code to fix some of those things. I can't remember if it's, I've actually come across it on the paragraph three. Mm -hmm. I, that actually sounds vaguely familiar. So it's highly possible. Um, it's definitely something that I have been reporting. So I always just get on the chat and be like, hey, this thing isn't working. Or this thing is wrong. Um, so yeah. All right. And, next question. Uh, the poster. This is, I created a whole little site to try it and see what it's like. And what really struck me is that whenever I did, whatever I did on there felt clunky visually. Whereas I don't struggle with that on 7.0. The blocks, the font, something about it all. Yeah. All of it. Does anyone else experience it that way too? And if so, why is that? Kind of a vague question, but I thought I'd ask in case you I know actually, what I mean. I actually know what you're saying. Because I feel like there's something with the section functionality of the way pages work now um, that does feel like it actually feels like you're sort of creating this like a little bit of a choppy, like as opposed to a flow. Um, I've had to be much more cognizant of am I, should I be adding a block or should I be adding a section? Like my workflow is. I keep accidentally adding sections when I really just need to be adding a block. It, that's does that make sense? Point. Yeah, that's, I, that, that totally makes sense. I, I really went through that when it was, because the first 7.0, 7.1 site we did was Art Hive, which I dropped in the chat earlier. And mm -hmm. we did an update session for them recently. And I went, I was like, man, this feels like a little like choppy or the, like tetris -y or something. <laughs> and so I did, I don't know if you noticed that I did some cleanup yeah. um, in general on their pages. And um, I, I sort of consolidated some things that had been in multiple sections into a single section. Um, I had actually had a couple of like the wrong, because one of the things that's been a little hard for me to get my head around is that they now have a thing called color palettes and you can pick a color palette for different sections. So yeah. I'd had um, like, where it was should have been like bold minimal or no white minimal i yeah. had white bold i think oh okay and it made some and it, like little things like so i found myself when i went back and looked at that site i found some like little clunky fussy things that when i cleaned them up it was a much improved flow um so yeah. i think that um it, there is something to that it is um it's, I think, I think it's this part of it is the sections. I think it really kind of, it sort of steers you to using sections unnecessarily when you actually just need to be yeah. using blocks. And one of the things that you can do is in each section, when you're editing it, you can really adjust the, the width on, yes. without using spacers and stuff. So that can allow you to not have to do sections for everything, I think, right? Yeah, and that was something also, that was actually another, thing that I realized on that first 7.1 site that we did, it, there were some places where we had used spacers because that's what we would do on 7.0. Yeah. 
and we should have been using the section with adjustments. So there were some things like that that I cleaned up. Um, but I do, I agree. Yeah. I understand what you're saying. And I think the non-designers in here will be like, what are they talking about? But there is something um, to be said for that. Yeah. The other thing, I've got to say this with the image layouts, like the different, different image layouts and the buttons. Uh, I'm frustrated by that. The buttons are, I mean, you can adjust the um, padding around the buttons, but it's one style mm -hmm. and it shows up as one style, even in the image layouts now. If you use the button in the image layouts, you've only got that one style. And sometimes it can just look ridiculously clunky huge, and you need code to change that. Yeah. Or you need to make all your buttons across. If, like if you're not going to use code, uh, all your buttons have to be a lot smaller so that it doesn't look so small on one of the image layouts. If you yes, choose to use it. That is layout. actually, I think yeah. one of the biggest issues why that happens, the stupid buttons. Totally agree. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> All right, Joe has a question. Button. <laughs> buttons. Any chance that 7.1 supports SVG format? Oh, I've kind of played with that for logos or other graphics. I'm not super, like I've played with SVG just to have fun with it as a You're code still option, but not as a logo. A code block. You can, it's, there are some ways to get an SVG logo into, which I prefer um into the logo field but it's pretty coding intensive and so it's not something i use for clients at this time um yeah. it's you can use i have used F svg for icons um yeah. those go into a code block um not an ideal solution i but i really like them they're fun <laughs> <laughs> thanks <Star Joe. laughs> A question about your workflow in 7.1. Do you wireframe or create a mock-up your client site before your build? Kind no, of like I hate wireframes. <laughs> I don't believe in them. I think they're crap. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Was that a little dramatic? I think that if you're using it, like, I, I mean, we do use, I usually do a sketch. Yeah. Literally. Yeah, like a little. Got like on a piece of paper, <laughs> my notebook, and I do a sketch. Um, and I talk to the client about it. Like I literally do it oftentimes when I do my strategy session before our, um, before our design starts, where we actually talk through like what the flow is going to be, um, you know, all that kind of thing. We literally like, and I literally will sketch it out while I'm while we're talking, and that's the extent of where. I feel like that's um, a lot. I, I like I said, I have really strong opinions about that, and I, I I think that in the past when we had to do things in Photoshop and then slice it up and do all kinds of things, there was a place for that. But for the people that we work with primarily, I no longer see that it's something that they find useful as a like quote unquote deliverable. Um, and so I just you know I would send that kind of thing to them, and they'd be like, okay. Because <laughs> it means what? nothing to them. It doesn't. It doesn't mean like like they. It's they're like. Is this a site that it, you know? It's just not something that people really get. And so, um, I, it's something that we quit. Kath, I don't even think in the time you've worked with me, it's something that I've done. No, we haven't really. I mean, it, there's been the odd case where we've received a kind of wireframe from a client. Normally, we don't go for that. And part of the problem with that is that a lot of times people want stuff that. that just, at a certain um, price point that Squarespace just can't do, right? Like it's just not possible. So that's another issue with yeah. wireframes. And that's, and, and part of my aversion to what my, my dog and wireframes, and I really shouldn't be such a jerk about it um, because I do think that they're very helpful to a lot of people um, in like design agencies and such when they're doing so they have like, we're three, you and I, you, me and Josh, we're three people. Like we don't need to have things passing yeah. up to yeah. the boss, you know? Um, so there's, there's some accountability on the agency side as to why they do that. But my experience in the past was, um, back in the day when I used to work with like partner with agencies where they would have sort of designs and they would pass them off to me to sort of implement on Squarespace was, which I don't do, um, anymore at all. Um, but I would, um, get this information. I would get these wireframes from them and they're like, this is the client approved this. And I'd look at it and I'd say, you realize that 30% of the stuff cannot be done on Squarespace and you promise the clients Squarespace. 
Yeah. And they would be like, well, just make it happen. And you can't, you can't just make it happen. And I see that a lot with wireframes that come out of that agency process is that they've actually created, um, they've gotten so stuck into some of these, um, they, they've forgotten about the technology. They're so focused on the layout and all of that kind of thing. And so yeah. Yeah. they've forgotten. I, I, like, obviously the way things look is important, but functionality is really crucial. And so you can't, um, wireframes, I think, sometimes detach you from the possibilities of what can and cannot be done. Yeah. I've just seen enough bad ones. That I have this very, I'm sorry, I get really on my high horse about this when I talk about it. <laughs> well, Maya is agreeing with you here. She says it's a huge problem. All right. I have a client that is currently using Wix. Should I convince them to use? Oh, and Joe did have a good, Joe, oh. Joe had a good comment on that last one. She said she uses Envision for a quick mock-up wireframe. I have done that. Yeah. where it, I just want someone to see what something will like kind of what I'm thinking. Um, and actually I even use Squarespace itself to do like a quick sort of like, does this flow make sense kind of thing where I'm not like, it's not a formal, it's just like, I'm kind of thinking something like this and it'll kind of be, and I, I actually have done that both in Envision and literally right in Squarespace. So yeah. I can send something live. Um, yeah. So that's not, and I even call it something like, you know, client name mock-up. So yeah. Yeah, and that's yeah, exactly the point of Envision isn't to communicate design, just flow in buckets of info. Bucket, yeah, yeah, and yeah. that's that's yeah, and I have done things like that. I just, you know, you know, <laughs> I, <laughs> I have a client that's currently using Wix. Should I convince them to use Squarespace? No, I would ask them. them <laughs> I would ask them why. What do you like? What do you like and not like about Wix? Yeah. yeah and determine if Wix is still going to be a good solution for them or if you need to look at another option, which could be many things. It could be Squarespace, it could be Shopify, it could be Webflow. Um, there's lots and lots of platforms out there. I never try to convince someone of a platform. I always try to convince them of an outcome. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> you need to. <laughs> never convinced, yeah. I don't think they have an opinion, is what Joe says in the chat. So, yeah, I mean, not, if it's not, if it, it works for them, it works. It works for them. Right? If it's not broken, yeah, I mean, unless it's you not wanting to work on it. <laughs> um, we are technically starting from well, scratch. Well, if you use Squarespace, then say, hey, I use Squarespace. Yeah. I will say that switching domains from Wix to Squarespace is weirdly a pain in the butt. Just make sure you get all the domain info early in the process because it's always a pain in the butt. I don't yeah. know why. And account for that time. <laughs> account for that like, time. Add it in, add in a I'm not, I'm not kidding. I Every time I move someone from Wix to Squarespace, I've had to do a like live chat thing with Wix to sort out the domain issue every single time, so. Arg, no thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's just a weird thing, and it's 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 literally just based on the way that they have their domain connection set up causes problems, yeah. and it's fine. It's not a big deal. Like they can fix it for you, but it's just it's very aggravating. It makes you feel dumb. So. so we have a couple more more minutes. So if anyone has any last minute questions, uh, we're around for if for a couple, couple more minutes. minutes. Um, <laughs> But I hope this helped. I hope this is helpful. If you have, you know, if you have Squarespace oh. seven point one questions, oh, what, Kath? I was just going to post my uh, my little playlist. Oh yeah, Kath. <laughs> Although so it does need some updates, but I do have a YouTube playlist where I compare seven point oh when I was practicing. Um, I was comparing seven point oh. Yeah, and subscribe to Kath's YouTube channel because she's so close to being able to monetize her channel. <laughs> yeah, because I, I was looking at my subscriber count today. I'm like, what has just happened? So, but um, anyway, um, but yeah, I, that um, I was going to say, I always, you know, we don't really do, um, uh, I we don't really do like pitches and stuff. We do these ask me anything, but we do have some cool stuff happening. So you're always, you know, welcome to check out our shop, which is shop.saramoon.net. And there's some free stuff in there. There's some paid stuff. Um, we have a Squarespace SEO workshop coming up next week. Yeah. Um, and we we're, are, we're enjoying these lives. We like doing really live. Enjoying these live things <laughs> and we do our, we have a membership program as well that, um, has, we do live stuff, um, in them also, um, because we think that's a really good way to kind of have some more dynamic conversation 
questions and like these questions are not questions I would have thought of. So that's why I also really like live stuff is like sometimes I'm like, oh, I love this. <laughs> So we'll send out a, an email with the recording as well. It comes from Crowdcast. Um, and uh, Julie, Julie also asked if we could send all these links out. So Sarah, I will go through and get grab all the links that we've posted in the chat. In the so chat. That you can throw them in the, okay, so I'll do that for you after this call. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, and if you came in late, um, the replay will be up here also um, pretty quickly. I think it comes up usually in like 15 to 20 minutes is actually available to watch the replay. So it's, which is pretty nifty. Um, so we're going to be doing another live next month. And I think we're going to be talking about email newsletters, sort of an ask me anything about email newsletters, because I've been doing a series on my newsletter about just all the stuff you need to know, because I get so many questions about this. Yeah. And so, and then our membership for August is also going to be about newsletters. And so we're going to just do our August. Ask me anything. It's going to be about newsletters. Yeah. So, uh, because we're just like, well, the, the things are converging where we're just going to be talking <laughs> about newsletters all August. <laughs> and I need to be working on my newsletter. <laughs> yeah, I need so to it. Yeah. That's, it's sort of a funny, it's, I don't know. I, I used to hate newsletters and now they're my favorite thing. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you, everyone. And I'll be in touch with you soon with all that information. Cool. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye, Sarah. <laughs>